Okay, great. Okay, thank you guys for coming. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Jay, for changing things up for us. Um, given that we had to change room and time today, so really appreciate you guys taking the time. So this week, we're going to be talking about the impacts of the new cannabis regulations, how they impact streams, and specifically how that um, matters to environmental flows in the state of California. So today, we've got um, Jen Kara, who's from TNC. She's a senior scientist there. She's been working with, hey, she's been working with um, Ted Grantham at UC Berkeley and Van Butzik, Butzik mm -hmm. at UC Berkeley as well. And they have a research project where they've been looking at the impacts of cannabis. And she's going to present a little bit of that result, some of those results this morning to help provide an overview just in general, like what is cannabis? What's the issue? Why do we care? How it relates to environmental flows? And then we'll take a small break. And then I'm going to introduce the other folks here. We'll have, and then we'll finish off the rest of this um, seminar with a panel discussion. Please ask questions. We like this to be free form. Uh, last week was great. We had a really good discussion amongst the group and hoping for something like that again today. So we'll just let it be free form and how it goes. And so with that, thank you, Jen. Thanks, Sarah. All right, so Sarah asked me to cover just kind of the basics of what do we know about cannabis and the environment um, and environmental impacts. And so I wanted to start with kind of just literally a satellite view of what does this look like on the ground and what kinds of land use development practices are happening associated with cannabis cultivation. So, oops, I'm gonna go back and replay that again. This is um, Google Earth imagery from Trinity County. Um, and you can see that scrolling through here, all of the development that's happening in this area are cannabis cultivation sites. Um, and you can see that fragmentation has increased pretty dramatically between 2004 and 2014. Um, large increases in the area of deforestation and the number of roads and that kind of thing. Um, increasing uh, fragmentation and um, just visually you can see that, but if you want to look at the data, um, Wang and Brenner and Butzik did a nice study in two, 2017 for Humboldt County where they actually quantified the fragmentation. Um, and you can see they've got on the left hand side here a bunch of different fragmentation metrics. Uh, and they compared cannabis cultivation fragmentation with timber harvest, which is the other kind of major agent of fragmentation in that area. And what they saw is not, not super surprising. Uh, at a landscape scale, the fragmentation that's associated with timber harvest is a much bigger deal than cannabis cultivation. Um, but in about a quarter of the watersheds, fragmentation associated with cannabis cultivation um, across all of the metrics they were looking at was more significant than that of timber harvest. Um, there were some particular metrics that they found were the most sensitive uh, to cannabis cultivation. One was total edge length and then changes to core area were two of them. Um, this was really heterogeneous across the watersheds they looked at. Uh, and as I said, in a quarter of the watersheds, cannabis was actually more of an agent of land use change than was timber harvest. So what does that look like on the ground? Um, there isn't great data on water quality impacts associated with cannabis cultivation at this point, but there's some pretty good anecdotal evidence that the impacts are significant. So this is a photograph on the left from California Department of Fish and Wildlife and on the right from the North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board. These are the kinds of things that they say they see on a regular basis when they go out and they're undergoing regulatory or enforcement activities around cannabis cultivation. Pretty significant issues with erosion and then the resultant impacts to water quality. Um, other water quality issues are associated with chemical application. So this is a photo from a, a cultivation site in Shasta County. You can see this is kind of typical of what I saw when I was out there that day. Um, not very careful storing of chemicals. <laughs> Things just sort of scattered about the landscape. Um, those are fertilizer boxes. One thing that has been more well studied is the impacts of second generation anticoagulant rodenticides on mammals in uh, areas near trespass cultivation sites in Northern California. So there's a couple of papers involving um, Murad Gabriel and Craig Thompson and others um, where they've looked at bioaccumulation of these anticoagulant rodenticides uh, in mammals in the air study area 
near uh, cultivation sites. They found that um, in a paper they just published this year, that about 70% of the northern spotted owls that they, um, carcasses that they recovered were exposed to anticoagulant rodenticides and about 40% of the barred owl carcasses that they recovered were exposed. And then there's a study from, I believe it was 2014, where, where Craig Thompson was the lead author, where they looked at Pacific fishers, um, both in Northern California and along the North Coast, as well as in the Sierra Nevada range, and found um, that over 80% of the Pacific fisher carcasses that they recovered had, had shown exposure to anticoagulant rodenticides. Jim, can you just explain how they get into the food chain and why they're yeah. these So um, wood rats like to chew things and make nests. And one of the things that they happen to like to chew, if you put a cannabis cultivation site out in the middle of a forest, they're going to come in and start chewing on your crop. And so the, um, in areas like that where you're out in the middle of the forest, usually these are black market kind of trespass cultivation sites that might be on public lands or they might be on industrial timber properties. The growers tend to put out a lot of these uh, rat poisons. And these are the kind of higher powered second generation rodenticides that cause uh, uncontrolled internal bleeding. And uh, so the rats and small rodents tend to eat these things. And then things like foxes or Pacific fishers that are higher up in the food chain eat the um, poisoned smaller rodents and it accumulates up, up through the food chain. And then there's just a lot of kind of general pollution that's been documented to be associated with cannabis cultivation. This is a photo from Murad Gabriel and some work that he's been doing uh, on U.S. Forest Service land in Northern California. It's not just, you know, regular trash from folks living out in the woods for five or six months at a time, but they find a lot of toxic materials um, that are used for growing associated with these trash dumps as well. And one would presume that, you know, at a high enough density, that material is probably leaching into nearby waterways. Um, this is a Another shot from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. This is a diesel powered water pump um, that's just kind of precariously perched there on the edge of the stream. Uh, there have been diesel spill issues that have been documented by California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the water board. Um, and there are obviously the, the potential water quantity impacts that could be associated with this kind of activity. So, in total, cannabis growers likely need a very small percentage of the amount of water that traditional agricultural users would use in the state of California. So if we compared you know, the amount of water in total that almond growers need to the amount of water in total that cannabis growers need, cannabis growers are going to need a very small portion of the water that almond growers would need in the state, say. Um, but as we saw in that Butzik study, growing often is taking, places, taking place in really remote forested watersheds. Um, in areas where water is not plentiful in the summer. We live in a Mediterranean climate and these are, um, because of its kind of quasi-legal status, a lot of the places that it's being grown are in these remote um, watersheds that don't have a lot of other development. And depending on the density of cultivation, this could have significant impacts. So um, this is from a figure from a paper from 2015 where we looked at on a per area basis, um, how does cannabis water demand relate to the amount of water that's generated in that watershed? And what we found is that the demand on a per area basis is depending on the water you're type between 10 to 20 times um, what's available per area. So I've said another way, if you're growing a cannabis cultivation site, um, you're gonna need 10 to 20 times that area in your ownership to generate enough water for your cannabis grow site. Is that seasonally or is that? That is seasonally. Okay. So how does this... Sorry, that's, that's the summer months, I think you were correct. Yeah, so that was for June through the end of October. So how does that play out in reality? Are, are cannabis grow sites located close enough together that this actually shows up as being a problem in real life? And the answer is yes. So this, this is a study by Scott Bauer and colleagues from the Department of Fish and Wildlife, where they mapped cannabis grow sites in four watersheds in Northern California. Um, on the right is Upper Redwood Creek draining out to Oric. 
In the middle is Outlet Creek near Willits. And then on the left are um, Salmon Creek and Redwood Creek, which are in the South Fork of the Eel. And they used Google Earth imagery and just heads up digitizing to go through and map cannabis cultivation sites. They measured uh, the total area of development, estimated the plant number for greenhouses where just based on the area because they couldn't see the plants. And then for outdoor cultivation sites actually calculated the number of plants that were being grown and used that information to estimate a total water demand per site. And then they compared total water demand per site against um, an estimate uh, or a, a actual calculation of annual low flow minimums. Um, so for those of you who don't think in cubic meters per second, I added um, cubic feet per second in there in red to the, um, the period of record minimums for low flow. Um, so you can see that the streams that they're looking at and they did the mapping in typically have pretty low flow conditions in the summertime. Um, and what they found when they compared water demand against the annual low flow minimums, um, what, in three of the four watersheds they looked at, the demand had the potential to completely dewater those, those smaller streams. Um, another interesting finding from that paper, they were, they were curious to know how many of these cannabis cultivation sites might actually have water right permits. And there wasn't a super clean way to do it. So what they did is they just queried the state's database and said, how many people in the, each of these watersheds have water rights? Um, they, they didn't map directly the cannabis growers to the water rights, but they just as a kind of quick and dirty analysis. Uh, and what they found is that very few people in these watersheds had water rights in the state's water rights database system. Um, in Salmon Creek, it was as low as like 6%, I think, of the, um, of, of the potential known uh, marijuana sites could have water rights based on what was in the system. Um, again, they don't know one-to-one -one whether or not these sites had water rights, but it's a pretty good indication that most of the cannabis growers out there didn't have legal water rights. Mm -hmm. Yep. So you might ask, well, that, that study was published in 2015. The data they were looking at was from 2012. So maybe things have changed between 2012 and 2016, and maybe they've gotten better. Um, I'm working, as Sarah mentioned, with Dan at UC Berkeley and others, and we have a paper in review right now where we, we basically did that analysis. We said, how have things changed between 2012 and 2016 with regard to the number and type and size of grows and their siting locations? And what we found is that there, and we did that for Humboldt County and Mendocino County, we mapped 50% of the HUC 12 watersheds in each of the counties um, and looked at size, location, relative to metrics of environmental sensitivity as well. We found an 80% increase in the number of cultivation sites between 2012 and 2016, a 60% increase in the number of plants per site. So we've got intensification and extensification. There was a tripling overall in the number of um, plants that were being grown and a doubling in the total area that under cultivation. We also found that that expansion was taking place in environmentally sensitive areas. So there was a doubling of cultivation sites near high quality endangered species habitat. We were looking at coho salmon and steelhead trout in this case. There was a 40% increase on really steep slopes, over 30%, um, and a 45% increase in area in remote areas, so places that were more than a kilometer away from a paved road, and a doubling of cultivation sites that were located within 500 meters of public land. Um, by saying all that, I don't want to leave the impression that cannabis growers are inherently um, poor land managers. Uh, any agricultural activity, as we know, has the potential to cause serious environmental harm. And as a society, we make a decision that we're going to regulate those activities to help prevent and mitigate those impacts. And in this particular case, I think one of the reasons that we see what we're seeing here is that that hadn't been happening for decades. Um, medical cannabis was legalized for production in California in 1996, but it was effectively unregulated until last year, um, or year before last. So 
um, I think that now would be a good time to actually bring up the policy folks um, and start taking some questions about how the science interplays with the policy. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, okay, so I'll introduce the, the rest of the panels then, okay. and maybe we'll just go ahead and move to the tables. Megan just walked out, but I think I'm going to shut this off. Um, Do you want me to turn this one off? Yeah, so maybe we'll keep that going, Nick. Yeah, I think she has to do that. Okay, I'll just zoom it out. Okay, great. Um, and Jen, if you're, you're welcome to that. So I'm going to introduce the rest of the folks here. So you guys have heard Jen. She's given some facts and background on um, the research. Ted Grantham is with UC Berkeley, mm -hmm. and he's worked with Jen and Dan um, quite a bit. Ted may be familiar too. He was with us at Watershed Center for a couple of years um, doing some postdoc work. He was really knowledgeable about environmental flows. So Jen has some of the bigger picture about cannabis impacts, and Ted has like, some of the ways to um, communication about cannabis and matching environmental flows. We have Matt Clifford, who is with Sean Limited, also has worked with TNC and Berkeley. Um, I'm going to ask you guys to please go past the microphone so it can get recorded into the, into the video there too. Um, and Matt can maybe give a little background on his work too. So he's worked quite a bit. A lot of the nonprofits are involved in this type of work, um, primarily as a way to help um, as in terms of stewardship and research, um, and particularly in these North Coast streams where fish are, you know, the impacts to the streams and to the aquatic resources are large. And then last but not least, thank you. This is Dan Schultz with the State Water Board, and he is um, basically the Lead scientist, in, what is your? I'm sorry, for the cannabis program. In the state. Environmental program manager. Environmental program manager for the cannabis program in the state. And Dan is the guy who um, will know everything there is to know about policy, so we can definitely ask questions to Dan. I think at this point, so the transition then really is from the science to what we know about the impacts. Um, in the last <laughs> two years, we have, with the passing of the, of the um, Cannabis Act, we've now set up regulations to help deal with this. And so maybe. Not to put you on the spot, Dan, but if you, is it possible to just have like a minute or two, give an overview of what the new regulations are, and then maybe open it up to questions on how to make um, impact to environmental flows, if you don't mind. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Dad. Should we do this or just yes, hold it um, Both, okay. uh, but that way it'll go into the... Okay. Thank you. Um, so, in, uh, basically, in, I'm going to get my years right, two, summer of 2016, um, my unit was uh, developed to address uh, Senate Bill 837, if I get my, again, it's been a while since I looked up this off of my head. I know, um, But no basically pressure. it was the uh, Medical uh, Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act. Um, there were three bills that were passed earlier in 2016 and, this, and the Senate Bill uh, consolidated those three bills. Um, and basically directed state water board amongst other things to develop the policy for water quality and the principles and guidelines to address the negative impacts of cannabis cultivation. Um, in particular, looking at the, uh, the water quality, aquatic, and um, insertion of water, water critters in the past. The, uh, so we developed a policy, and, and as we were developing that policy, of course, the adult use went into effect, and then Senate Bill 94, you'll have to put those up to make sure I'm right, uh, was then also passed in July of 2017, which consolidated all the, the cult of the use of the missile. Um, it didn't really impact our development of the policy at that point because we were already moving forward to address cannabis cultivation of the whole. And we developed the um, policy for water quality control. We brought it before the state water board for adoption on October 17, 2017. Policies for water quality control are a lot like a regulation. So that goes to the Office of Administrative Law for review and final approval. And that was approved on December 17, uh, 2017. So basically, the requirements are in the policy. It's we call it attachment A of the policy, which is where all the requirements are listed are located. Those requirements get incorporated and implemented through three main programs. One is the uh, statewide um, general order for waste discharge requirements. That goes through our water quality and regional boards. Uh, the second is through the cannabis small irrigation and use registration program, which is basically a small water right of uh, less than 20 acre feet. It's actually capped cannabis at. 6.6 .6 acre feet per year. Um, and the uh, third, and it's kind of an expedited water right as well, so it's passing uh, time for water right. The third program is that, um, all the requirements from the policy are also incorporated in any license issued by the California uh, licensing California Department of Health. Great. 
So I'll go ahead and open it up to questions. Sure. Uh, scientifically, do we have a good sense for what the actual consumptive water needs of, of cannabis are on like kind of per area basis? I understand there's a lot less area-wide impact, but can we compare this reasonably to other bigger ag crops? The answer is no right now. Uh, but we're for the studies that I mentioned, we were all using the same estimates, which were numbers that had been kind of informally thrown out by a growers association eight years ago. Uh, and there's been a lot of quibbling about whether those are the right numbers, and I'm sure they're not the right numbers. Um, so one of the things that I'm working on with Ted and others at UC Berkeley and UC Property Extension specifically is to put together, we've already done it, we put together a grower survey um, that we're going to be sending out through growers for associations and third party certifiers um, to actually get better information on that, which I think will be really great for the growers and it'll be really helpful for us to better understand and be able to generate those kind of numbers. I think it's going to be going out in the next two months. So the number, I think, Jen, right, is, is six gallons per day per plant. That's the infamous number that. Yeah. You probably don't like to say in public because people's eyes will say that's not right. I mean, it's a wide average over it's just like the, the best way I've You'll see that number out there, you know, sometimes um, so the literature it's probably overstating. You'll see it like <laughs> there's a lot of this and, and it's pretty widely agreed. There's just a lot of different types of pros. Probably accurate for some, it's probably the um, the reason I grabbed the microphone quickly make a point here, I always want to get at this point that the impacts, the water impacts of of marijuana are probably as a crop, it's, it's, it's not a terribly thirsty crop compared to other things. It's certainly not rice. I don't think it's even as thirsty as you say alfalfa. I mean, if you look statewide, the actual water demand from cannabis is not terribly high, but it doesn't follow from that that it doesn't have huge water impacts because where it's been grown traditionally is doing these small watersheds, like you talk about the impact. So if they have really intense local impact, you can dry up small headwater streams, which is what we need to try to live with it and so involved with because that's. If you draw a map of where marijuana fishing is grown up in the north coast of California and overlap that with a map of the critical salmon, I have a cap, you know, it's largely the same map. And it gives us devastating effects at the local level. And then I would just add that uh, both legislation and the policy and uh, California's regulations um, also require uh, cannabis use to start reporting the annual water use. Because it is going to vary a lot um, by the uh, the type of growth site, whether it's indoor, mixed light, outdoor, and then how they grow the outdoor. Um, just throw some more numbers around that we've had that heard as part of our outreach. Um, in like Calaveras County, it's about an acre foot to an acre foot and a half from your foot per acre of outdoor. Um, down in Santa Barbara, I can probably get the folks going to it's more like a half acre foot per acre. Um, up in the North Coast, where your uh, medium sized mixed light uh, license type, it's about 150,000 gallons per year. So those are the kind of numbers we hear. And then, of course, if it's an indoor site, they can do a lot more with water reclamation and those type of efforts to reduce water use. But for us, moving forward, we're looking at what we're getting from the cultivators themselves to start to break that into different types of cultivation activities so we can get a better idea and actually address that through future um, policy requirements. Just have one more, uh, one more number to you know, the conversation. So, Based on Van's, the number that Van developed um, recently assessed for Pendency in Humboldt County and looking at the Eel River uh, watershed, he estimated a total demand of on the order of 12,000 acre feet um, of, of water. Um, and putting that in context uh, with the Potter Valley diversion, which is about 150,000 acre feet. Um, so, again, not to say that just because overall there's a small amount of water, these impacts aren't uh, very significant locally. Um, to kind of put this into the environmental environmental flows context. The way we you know we think about these systems from an environmental flow management perspective is very different than probably the types of approaches that you talked about today when you're you're talking about regulating water from from large water infrastructure projects or below below dams. Um, there are again local impacts, but also what we're concerned about in these we consider more decentralized water management settings are the cumulative um, impacts of multiple uh, of multiple growth. And so the approaches that are needed to um, protect environmental flows in these systems are very different from those that are traditionally used to manage 
manage and quantify environmental flow needs um, below, you know, below large dams or large water infrastructure projects. We can talk more about that with our questions. So what's the traction, just sort of two-part question. <clears throat> First, what's the traction been on that sort of expedited water right program? And then sort of secondly, in your estimation, how do you see growers coming into compliance with new regulations on water quality? So, so far, our um, small irrigation registration numbers are pretty low. I think last I heard, there were about 27. We have one so far that we've applied or filed for. Um, and the part of that is right now, um, California Department of Food and Ag is issuing temporary licenses. Those temporary licenses are good for four months, and they don't need to, to come into compliance with anything but their local permit until that period of time. Um, so, we're seeing kind of a delay rollout. The ability to issue temporary licenses get for the first year through the rest of this calendar year. Um, so all of that will kind of delay when we start to see numbers coming our way. Uh, there are requirements where they have to at least get their um, their general order, their their uh, permit under the general order, or they're already enrolled in Region One, North Coast, Region Five, Central Valley, who had the existing uh, waste discharge requirements. We can use that to get their license. Uh, we've been seeing a lot more activity on that side. Um, the other component is that for the, the way we drafted the policy for the first year of stream flow requirements, basically the need for this storage program is for cannabis water for cannabis cultivation has to come from storage. Um, we're not allowing them to use their uh, riparian right through the um, to, to the dry season or the summer period uh, moving forward. So, but we did recognize that when the policy was adopted, it's during the no work period of time when they get to any work and then disturbance on their site. Winter period. So, in order to accommodate that, we have a modified first year um, kind of moving into the more strict forbearance period. And for that, they have until March 31st to come in and get their small education use registration. Um, so, we're going to see some delay there. Um, some people, the other the other big piece is just outreach, getting getting to these people, getting them in through the door, making sure they know what the requirements are. There's a ton of, of folks that are still on the um, I think on the um, on the edge, I'm not sure if they want to come into the regulatory programs as far as licensing in general. Um, so waiting to see those folks come across and part of that moving forward as far as getting them under the regulatory umbrella, it's going to be a lot more outreach education to to these folks as we go out and do inspections. Um, we have other enforcement related actions that are continuing and have been continuing. They'll be expanding more statewide in conjunction with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And kind of what we're trying to do is really just move those people into the regulatory board and through compliance, getting them to bring their sites up to the um, requirements that are in the, in the policy so that they can stabilize their sites moving forward and establish it. And then, you know, we have people that either don't want to improve their sites and try to hide under the regulatory umbrella or don't want to come in when we have more standard enforcement activities on the pieces of those folks. So these regulations do what we consider basically, they, they, as a matter of, of rule, they kind of force operators that want to be illegal to do what we consider to be good water management practice in coastal California. They never allow the water in the wet season, store it, use that in the dry season, don't do it in the dry season. That is exactly the kind of project that the kind of limited and major concern to see others have been promoting voluntarily with, with, with farmers and residents and private water users on the coast for a lot of years. And so this regulation comes along and, and, and basically says, if you want to legally grow cannabis, you have to do that as a matter of fact, this is part of your legal, as part of your permit requirements. A worry um, that we have as policy matter is that, you know, understand they had to get this regulation out pretty fast, pretty short time ago. It's a statewide regulation uh, for, for water use and for cannabis. And so necessarily it has to be protected across a pretty large geographic areas kind of, I won't say one size fits all, but I mean, certain aspects of it that are, and, and so the actual forbearance period that requires growers to, uh, to use is a very long one. I think it's uh, May 1st through at least November 1st, is it May? Yeah, May, May, or no, April 1 through uh, April. April 1st. So, you know, we typically in the North, so we see involuntary programs are more like, you know, say June 15th, June July 1st, something like that. So the point is, like, this requires folks to build a lot of storage. Storage is very expensive. Okay, so one concern we have with this is basically in a lot of areas, it's, it's, it's going to be a high enough barrier to entry that it's not really going to be a viable path for growers. And growers aren't just going to go away. They're going to continue to do what they've done for 20, 30 years. So they're going to 
you know, diverting illegally and running illegal operations. So there's really a push pull there. I don't fault the water board for that. I mean, it's, it's hard to get this thing together in the time period they did. But I think there's a lot of room for improvement. And I think we don't know how that's going to shake out yet as far as how the you know, barrier to compliance of, uh, you know, take out the or just benefits on the ground. Is there discussion of creating some sort of financing vehicle, creating incentives around that? Uh, upgrading systems, water efficiency storage? I haven't heard a lot of that. Most, most guys that I've heard as well, it's a pretty lucrative business, you know, considering to be. You know, a lot of rivers will take issue with that, but you know, I, most guys, you know, the cost of doing business, I've read this read but they, you know, they can do it. Do that. I haven't heard a lot about financial assistance for, for this. Is, so I'll ask the hard question though. It, when you get up in front of needs to try to encourage growers to come in and to respond to surveys, is there a conversation like you're going to put us out of business? Is, is the pushback there? I certainly hear that. So I sit on an advisory committee that's developing licensing rules with the Department of Food and Ag and some other folks, and we, we get a lot of cultivators coming in. And I certainly hear that message a lot. You probably do too. I mean, yeah, they're going to put us out of business. I mean, how much of that is true? I, 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 everything's your bucks now. It's a brand new industry that's never been legal. It's an industry that's existed for years, you know, but now it's becoming illegal. I think you know, those of these things will shake out. There's a bunch of other factors that are going into people's decisions about whether or not to come out of the shadows and come into business that have nothing or little to do with the cost of complying with regulation, they can still, I mean, it's quasi-legal still in California, um, federally illegal. So there's still a lot of money, more money to be made spending it out of state than there is to sell it in the legal market in California. So if you're selling it in the legal market in California, you're going to be able to sell it for less. You have more cost associated with coming into compliance to get legal. Um, you can avoid those regulatory costs and make more money on a per pound basis if you sell it out of state, as long as it's federally illegal and demand paying better um, those states that haven't legalized it as well. So we've got that whole other regional on top of the regulatory costs. What's the number you guys work with on that? How much percentage is leaving the state? I've seen 70, 80 percent. Yeah, the, um, there aren't very good numbers on that, but. Uh, 60 to, the numbers I've seen are 60 to 70 percent. We, the California supply is 60 to 70 percent of the consumer calls for By volume or by volume? Um, by volume. <laughs> yeah, so that's right. walking up the tour. That was based on um, enforcement numbers. And then the number that's thrown around, if yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, but is you know, about a $20 billion mm -hmm. industry and put that in context of California agriculture is about 40 billion in total for traditional crops, probably the highest being dairy about 10 billion a year. So it's um, it's not, a, it, it's a pretty astronomical number when you start looking at the economic value of this industry. Do you think with it becoming more legalized at least in California that Growers on the legal side will say, "Why should we be growing up on the North Coast? It's cheaper to grow it somewhere else. The water's going to be easier. There's a lot fewer regulations. Costs are going to be less. We're going to have to build these tanks." I sure hope so. <laughs> you know that, that that'll move out of the North Coast and into the rest of some place stuff. Uh, we grow a lot of stuff. Yeah, you <laughs> the water use per acre yeah. is pretty low, actually. Most yeah, the, um, the tricky thing is that every county is regulating this differently mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. another. So what's really controlling the siting decisions and land use are the local county land use ordinances. Some counties are banning it altogether. A lot of the Central Valley counties, for example, where you think this might be going if, that, if the economics were driving it. Um, so it's hard to say right now because the local land use ordinances are are really controlling where in the state it can be grounds. It's not just the economics that are driving those siting decisions yet. But all it takes is one big agricultural county to decide, sure, we've got room for 13,000 acre feet of this. Yeah. Yes, yeah. There's a lot of sound key value here in agriculture that's going to have to reduce its water use by a lot. We can keep a lot of those acres in. Yeah. Monterey County is, we hear about those a lot. I've also been told that's kind of a different segment of the industry. I, I, I think to the extent that, well, I've had a couple things. I think it, yeah, my, my name, I think it will be and should be a lot harder to legally grow up in steep watersheds of the Monterey County than it will be in 
that because and it's nothing against pot, it's just that you know, any crop you're developing up there, you have to put roads in there, you've got you know, some steep slopes, you've got a limited water supply. It's not a place for everything. You know, it's just not a place for everything. People aren't growing up there because no matter where they grow pot, they're growing up there because it was illegal and that's hard for the optimism, right? I mean, you know. Well, now there's a pushback on this. Like, yeah, industry people will not agree. With you. Yeah, they'll say, "By gosh, we have, you know, we have Appalachians up there. Like, why? You know, it's like it's growing on this slope and not You know, there's a reason to grow it up there. So I can see them creating a niche market. And I, I'm skeptical, but I'm not. I'm not an expert on it. <laughs> I'm just telling you. But, you know, I'm not. I'm not a connoisseur in that. So maybe there is a niche market to be had up there. But I, it seems to me that. They're never going to be able to compete with folks in the big flat areas of the South. But it's to the extent the industry is going to hang on up there long term, you know, a lot of folks think it's be for kind of higher people willing to pay for, for a certain quality of be grown in a certain way in a certain place. And maybe there's some room for that. But I you know from a purely fishery standpoint, that would be the dream is to have the big flat stuff out from deep the high, you know, steep drain to small drainages and have it move out of salmon country and live there. I would say we, we are seeing a large number in Southern California programs. Mm -hmm. Probably be yeah. and growing most of the, of the supply in the legal market. I think a lot of the North Coast and, and that area will still obviously have a deep, um, kind of more tourist based industry there. Um, but I think the biggest thing, and, and it's kind of waiting to see, there's a couple of things waiting to see how it plays out, is that when you look at right now, when you look at how it was originally set up, was it favored those smaller? Uh, the small industry to try to get their foot in the door to because they're the ones that help push some of the uh, legislation through. Um, so it kind of favored them the way the Department of Food and Ag regulations rolled out. It kind of allows for much larger uh, sites to be established. So we might start to see a shift now where people are thinking you know, they're only turning one acre in. Does that really work the risk of the rest of their business? And not sure how things are going to shake out as far as how the feds treat it and everything else. Then the other thing to keep in mind of any of these, um, so a lot of the larger ag have holdings in other states. And once you have holdings in other states, you can, the feds can come through potentially through your other holdings there and come up and get funded. So I think there's a lot of, it's, it's a weird liability issue uh, that they would be putting themselves up for whether or not that risk of it potentially somehow. So I think I look at 2023 more as a 21. <coughs> When it's set up the legislation for it to be moved into larger scale production, but that's when we're going to see more of that shift and also have to make the industry help to set something up to those components as well. Go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. I need to pause for two seconds because it's going to be Go for it. You had mentioned some outreach from the cooperative extension. To what extent do you see participation on a sort of operational level, you know, from Property extension agents focused on the chemist industry. Yeah, what they, I mean, so this is kind of their, they're getting their feet wet. They get federal money, mm -hmm. so they can't be seen or the case can't be made that they're aiding and abetting essentially the cultivation of federally illegal Schedule One drug. Um, so they can start by better understanding what cultivation practices are, what the, cult, what the, the um, extension needs are. So what do they need help with? Do they need help with pests? Do they need help with water? You know, what are the, the issues that they're struggling with? All seems to be kind of in the safe zone um, where they're just understanding what's happening but not changing what's happening or directly influencing what's happening. Um, so that's kind of where they're at right now is stuck a little bit between the rock and the hard place with actually being able to be a, a, an official advisor to anybody who's growing kind of this. They're not, they're not able to do that yet. So it's all private sector that's happening, sort of, if at all. Um, if at all, yeah. There are, um, so there are third party certification um, services that are helping with the waste discharge requirements and things of that nature. And so, you know, to the degree that any of that kind of stuff is happening, it's probably happening through them. Yeah, I just had um, a word of extension. And um, yeah, we're just, just in the last year, um, you know, we've sort of gotten more or less clearance from from administration to engage on these issues in, in certain ways. And like as Jen mentioned, basically we can't be contributing to the profitability of, of these enterprises, but um, you know, in terms of focusing on reducing environmental impacts, um, improving pest management, uh, you know, pest application, et cetera, that, that's certainly uh, within uh, the purview. But I think you see is as, as, as a whole that's sort of grappling 
uh, with this issue trying to figure out, um, you know, what, what types of projects, research projects, um, you know, could, could be funded. Um, you know, everyone's kind of got their eyes on, you know, this, the, the tax revenues that are going to be coming to the state. Um, and a certain proportion of these tax revenues will be focused on, um, you know, mitigating environmental impacts of, of cannabis and, um, you know, where, where that money's going to go and how it's going to be distributed. I think it's open and known that you see is certainly mindful of that. I'm mindful of that. And I think, I mean, as you've already heard, I mean, this is a, I mean, we have lack very basic information on on the way that this crop is, is grown, it's water use, it's pesticide, fertilizer use, um, that are really important. Um, and, you know, we sort of the policy, we make the best, best guess and try to develop pest management practices, but um, there's a lot about this problem that we just don't know. And until we conduct the, conduct the research, um, we're not going to be able to get it. Um, Come with solutions that really work for, for you know, for the public and for and for growers. So, um, when you guys have updated your observations on, on cannabis gross, um, which you observed uh, expansion and intensification, do you see any sophistication in the methods that maybe trespass growers were using to grow their crops? And if so, did that? Prove any water quality or? Yeah, this was all done with remote sensing. So um, our, the mapping that we did, we're assuming that our ability to detect an actual cultivation site um, is low for trespass cultivation. So most of the grow sites that we mapped are probably not trespass cultivation sites. They're probably sites that are being grown in the style of um, the legal medical marijuana uh, prescriptions and regulations, even if they're not legal. They are sites that are easy to identify from remote sensed imagery. They're not trying to hide, um, which would be the opposite kind of, of, the, of what we know about the way that trespass cultivation sites are operated. So A, I don't think we probably captured that many trespass cultivation sites in our mapping. And B, because it was remote sensing, we don't really have any way to determine changes in practice. Can you try to relate that with data for sales of pumps and irrigation equipment on the ground in these counties with retailers? You can see a lot of the industry on the ground that's out in the open. All you can do is drive around mm -hmm. and pump it, see pallets and fertilizers everywhere. But. Yeah, to get a kind of estimate of what we think. Um, um, how much fertilizer is being sold in the Right, and, and how does that compare with the number of sites that we have relative to what we think the demand would be for fertilizer to guesstimate the number of? Maybe. Um, yeah, there's one thing that I know that, that um, folks are starting to think about that trespass grow issue is to is through modeling. Um, so Murad Gabriel and colleagues at the Integral Ecology Research Center have been doing a lot of work on trespass cultivation sites and on um, forest service land. And they've started to develop models um, for site selection and number of rows per area based on site suitability. Um, so I think they're probably, in the short term, going to have the best chance of coming up with defensible numbers for quantifying what trespass cultivation looks like. We've had a lot of trouble getting environmental flows established on most of the streams in California, just in general. And I'm wondering if this is a little bit like the, the drought was in getting us to have groundwater legislation, groundwater regulation. Is, is the, we seem to have some environmental flow regulation coming fast in the cannabis areas with the cannabis program. Is this going to set some sort of precedent that makes it easier for us to do the rest of the state? I mean, it could. I mean, you know, it's just been painfully slow. Yeah, it has been. And, and, you know, so, yeah, I, this is this is what I work on. I mean, I came on staff in 2013, and I didn't come on to the cannabis, right? I came on to the voluntary water project. And I said, well, you know, you can see if, if you're working on water in coastal California at that time, you're working on cannabis, that's the biggest water you're seeing. And at the time, Basically, I just uh, uh, take a little bit of issue, I think, with one of Jen's 
charts there where she showed the number of cannabis parcels in the water. She had the number of reported water rights. The thing you need to know is that's not different than you would find in most of California because almost everyone has a riparian water right. I, I don't know how much you guys think about that. But I'll, I'll stay out of the weeds, I promise. But bottom line is, if you own property in a stream in California, you've got a riparian water right. You can basically have a right to use a reasonable amount of water. And, you know, Anybody can do it. Nobody reports, you're supposed to report those to the state, you know, so the state knows you're there. But the state, these folks don't have direct jurisdiction over the water right. You have that right. You're not, you're not illegal because you don't report it, other than you're not reporting that. But you still have that water right. When I came on board, all the cannabis growers out there were like in this uncertain, if, if you were growing cannabis, you might be legal on your medical laws, et cetera. And so you had property on a stream, you could divert it and grow that. You had a legal water right to grow cannabis. But as soon as you wanted to do what we want you to do, store water. Now you need an appropriate right. You have to talk to these folks and get that permit from the state. And there was kind of no legal way to do it. I mean, if you wanted to go riparian, you know, it's like, you know, you're, you're, you're pumping all summer as bad as the stream, you want to store it, but you can't because it's another crop. And, and you know, just a, you get a full appropriate right, but that's a, that's a really heavy method. There's kind of no legal way to do it. These regulations, to get to the point, are a huge step forward. Because now we have a way to issue water rights at scale for a lot of little diversions of the coast and kind of have some means of saying, here's where it's okay, there's enough tree flow you can divert, it. here's where you, you can't without harming fisheries. And that's a great thing. And we're, you know, it, it's a model that we didn't have you know, three, four years ago. And so I, I think it'd be wrong to say there's not some promise there as a model that you go. I think there's a lot of room for improvement in it. And I think it's a great model to put out of use because there's, there's nothing unique about the pot. The whole coast of, all the coast of California Streams are impaired by large numbers of widely scattered, relatively small diversion. And that's a tough thing to regulate. And this is one. So I, I don't know if it will, I, I mean, I, I think it, it kind of, there's a number of actions that are occurring that help establish the way forward the starting of requirements for um, all water diverters. Um, there's obviously the, the made up plan update. Um, some of these proceedings when you're dealing with pre-1914 uh, very, very senior rights in especially complicated systems where you have you know, projects and everything else, it's a very long process to go through that effort to, to establish new clubs and, and to with enough water rights and those kinds of water rights. Um, that's just going to be a long process whenever you've got enough time. Um, one of the components with the um, the flow requirements for cannabis in particular is that it does have sequel exertion to it, as long as it doesn't relax existing flow state. Um, that's the only way that we were able to get flow requirements in place in the timeline that we have. Um, when we move forward, we're also looking at different approaches. Um, the, the typical approach to developing instrument flows in California has always been looking more at the site specific instrument flow studies. Um, typically, we do some sort of uh, I have incremental flows, I always get it mixed up, in-stream flow incremental methodology, which is IFIM and doing some physical habitat studies. Those are very resource intensive. They cost a lot of money to do. They take a lot of time to develop. And that gets you to the state where you now have what the, uh, what the fish or other ecological components that you need. But then we, at the water board, we take that information and start to balance it. And that's really where the time starts to do really look at our balancing and then evaluate um, you know, one of the, the biggest impact that we're evaluating is impacts to existing agriculture and potential impacts of what we're having them, what they would likely do to um, continue operations. And that's where that kind of area right there is where the nuts and bolts of time. Um, we, the, the impacts of, of the cost impacts and everything else that we have to mitigate for becomes very difficult. And then also, generally, if we do an in-stream set any kind of in flow requirements, so that system as well before it's going to be upheld. So that's kind of this current process. Um, with, with Canvas, as I was mentioning, we're trying to move away from some of the site-specific information and using site-specific information a little bit more regional and stream flow requirements. And I think that will also help to start to move things through a little bit faster because you're looking at a bigger area of one situation for its developing stream flow requirements. So, um, so we're working um, on methodology to kind of go through and do original industry flow requirements to try to establish some of those uh, through cannabis, which I think once, you know, from the water board's perspective, 
the, the easiest and fastest way to live through the process is to really get the stakeholders involved to get buy-in from all the different groups to help move forward. It's a very difficult thing to happen. I think it's going to take some time for um, the water users in the state to realize that potentially stuff is coming their way and there might be changes, so it's better to get out ahead of it and wait to, then to react to it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's always going to be a lengthy process when we have to go get through the whole um, the whole of the water rights here in the Senate. I mean, they got the plan update started in 2006. First of all. But, but somehow there's enough force of will to have some kind of environmental flow through with cannabis much faster. Yeah, they're, yeah, much faster. So, but it was legislative. Correct. Yeah. So, does that make it set some precedents that will make it possible to accelerate the rest of the environmental flow? Kind of issues. I, from water boards standpoint, that would probably be in order for us to be more. You know, it's a it's, it's, it's such a such. But if what if, what if the method of the procedures are found to be acceptable for in this case uh, basins that are that happen to be cannabis regulated, but the same method approach can be used in other in other basins throughout the state. Well, I think right now what we are looking at is for the so I, I didn't mention earlier the um, Water code, the legislation for cannabis crisis and health interim and then long term uh, principles and guidelines and requirements. Um, so we developed the interim, it's what we adopted. We're looking more regionally and developed long term flow requirements. Those flow requirements are going to, to pretty much be looking at water use in the area. It's not going to be particularly looking at um, cannabis water use or street flow conditions needs for how just cannabis impacts that. It's looking at developing flow requirements for the watershed. Right? Um, and then, and then figuring out what the demand is for cannabis and what kind of water is available for cannabis as well. Um, and part of that is, you know, the legislation kind of puts stricter requirements on, on cannabis cultivators and the water that they use than other, other water users have. So they're kind of naturally water used for cannabis cultivation particularly. And the other use they have on the property is different, but cannabis water is kind of put that more to end with the line. Um, the benefit to the cannabis cultivators is that they're being kind of forced to go to storage, but they're also going to go to storage it's first in time, first in, first in line, first in right. So they are getting their water right established prior to other folks that, that are still exercising their water right. It's kind of a trade off. Can I just, I'll be brief on some more questions. But just add a couple of I mean, there was specific legislation, right, that enabled this whole thing. We got a special rule passed for cannabis that we don't have. It really allowed us to bypass some of the usual roadblocks we have to deal with other water rights. Okay, so we're trying to get a similar thing. I mean, there's specific authority by the, the Water Board and, and CBFW both have to specifically come up with in-stream flow standards, um, you know, figure out how much water needs to be in that stream, and then condition these water rights accordingly to meet those standards. I mean, you can get that outside of Canada. There are other processes for doing that. Like, like Dan, they've been going on for years and you know, may outlive a lot of us you know, here. But, but we got kind of an accelerated lane. We got specific explicit authority for Canada. You would think it applies to groundwater and springs as well, not just surface water. So a lot of, we don't have to argue in some cases about is the jurisdiction over this, so we have to decide to find the state your groundwater is connected with that. But no, they can regulate that. That's huge. Mm -hmm. Finally, um, one thing in the bill was there was an exemption to the California Environmental Quality Act. Huge. Yeah. We would not be sitting here today talking about these rules if that were not in there because we would have had, you know, we love CEQA as much as anybody in water regulation, but sometimes you just don't, you get the benefits, you just don't have the time for an analysis of the rulemaking of all the impacts and everything to get things done. So I think a really wise decision was made that the benefits to be gained from regulating us are far outweigh the downsides. So that was you you mentioned earlier some of the enforcement mechanisms as part of the regulation. What what is that look like? Is that a CDFW, arm police officer, sheriff's department? Who shows up? Sort of what happens? Um, well, there's a number of different enforcement you know, jurisdictions. Um, there's obviously your local enforcement. Um, both enforcing their local ordinance and people that are on compliant with their local ordinance or if they don't have an ordinance, they don't have a cultivation agreement. Um, 
So it, it kind of depends on, on the arena, but a lot of our current efforts through the Watershed Enforcement Team, which is a multi-agency task force, we see at WM State Water Board uh, and the regional water boards. So it's both water rights and, um, and regional boards. And then um, often uh, local, often the local sheriffs come out as well. And basically the way it works is what they've been doing in the past is they look at areas with heavy cultivation, high resource value and target those areas for uh, kind of a watershed wide sweep. And they go out and they inspect the site, see if they have their permits and they're up, up to uh, you know, have everything they're supposed to have. And they go typically, you see get the wardens will cut down their plants and they'll get a clean up from the order from the regional board. Um, they'll get water rights enforcement from water rights if they have the local version that's not reporting. Um, the, that, that's kind of what has been happening in the past. Um, now, moving forward from the water board's perspective, we're really looking at now that the structure exists for these for cultivators to come in and to stabilize their site and to move forward. We're really just trying to, to get out to them and get them the, under the regulatory umbrella, as we say. Um, and the, what, the wet team or the watershed enforcement team will continue their activities moving forward. Um, we've uh, got additional resources as well to expand those activities. Statewide, so we'll have kind of more presence in just the north coast than um, mainly the northern part of Region 5 up in the Reading area. Um, so that will be expanded. Um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife also has the, I want to call it the MET team, and you know, I can't remember what the name stands for, but that's their um, their trespass probe team. Marijuana <laughs> team. That would make perfect sense. <laughs> um, and, that looks at, and that looks at trespass. So the state water board, we just look at private. Is that yeah. Good question. So I think the Jeff's presentation, one thing that you saw is that it's been an incredibly dynamic industry in the past 10 years. We've seen tremendous growth in the number of sites and the size of sites. Um, some sites have disappeared, um, usually the smaller ones. Um, the, the price of, of cannabis has been dropping dramatically each, each year. And this number that's kind of floated around kind of in the industry is, you know, once prices reach around $500 a pound, like we're, we're, we're out. Um, some growers are going, you know, in, in response to price dropping, are growing, are expanding their operations. So there's just so many different factors in play. That's just, it seems it's really difficult to predict what the future looks like. So I'm going to ask you to do that. Um, <laughs> what, what does kind of cannabis production look like in, in, in 10, 20 years? It's a, almost an impossible question to answer, I think, in part because it's going to be really dependent on what happens with federal law. Um, so I think that that's going to be I think, probably the biggest game changer for what happens with cultivation and health. Um, and I have no sense for when or how um, that bridge would be crossed. Can I, can I ask a question kind of specifically into that before? I'm wondering if there's like a tipping point of states that you think uh, changes the scenario in California too, where enough other states can become producers and environmentally in California. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I, guess, I guess without without actually changing federal law, but more just like the economics of a change because enough other states get in the game. Or is it just a new president and attorney general? <laughs> yeah. No, I wanted the same thing. What point do you have in those states to legalize it? And, and you grow it in state. You know, a lot of states, I, I, I could be wrong, but I think most states are not going to have the same level of outdoor industry. It seems like a pretty good place to grow five outside. <laughs> I'm not an expert. But there's a lot of states, you, know, you can grow it either you know, in greenhouses. Or, at what point do enough states have in state markets that they really depend on the interstate black market in California? I don't, I don't know the answer. That's a great, that's one of the things that makes it so hard to predict. But any probably not just the number of states, but which states. So it'd be like, when do New York and Connecticut go? You know, like when do the states sure. do make up the most, you know, the, the highest percentage of demand for California cannabis growth? They probably do when that would actually happen. Dan, what's your prediction? Well, I think the way, the way we kind of look at setting this up is we start with, we have now 
kind of black and white, but we have a lot of people operating in the gray. I say kind of black is your labor market, white is your market. The gray is people that are, you're not really sure yet which, which way they're going to go. So over the next couple of years, I think you'll, that, that, that will be more established, that you're either legal or you're legal uh, once these programs are running. And that, I, there's a number of things that need to happen as well. You know, enforcement needs to happen in local, local counties and, and organizations need to pursue enforcement on their end as well to help you know, kind of clean up the industry from the more visible. I, and I'd like to think, at least, that we would be setting, going back in time to what we used to see back in like the 90s as far as the cultivation of grain. Because kind of, the concept there is not to force it out into the middle of the woods or something, but I think when it's so clear with the days of sensing and imagery, it really is pretty easy to identify all these sites of you know, compare and put up the way they're, being, they're set up now. So if we can start to clean up that and clean up those sites that are illegal, I think it's a path forward. When, when we really look at how much is going to stay illegal, I think that's going to be hard to tell and how big a foothold people have in California and how aggressive we are with our enforcement strategy from, from the open market. Just along that same train of thought, um, Oregon, Washington, do, are they seeing the regulation in states that are close to us that have similar production, um, I guess, potential. Um, are they implementing similar ordinances? Are we just pushing them out of the state into states with like, your regulations in that sense? I guess, kind of, do you have any idea of that? Well, I can start on some of that. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the uh, interstate <laughs> coordination happened with California Department of Food and Agriculture and Central Public Health and, and those agencies, so not necessarily the state water board. Um, and that's looking at how they established and set up the regulatory program a couple, a track and trace and all those different components and a lot of, you know, lessons learned, what's working, what's not working, what would you do different that we try to incorporate or those entities try to incorporate. Uh, the state water board is a little bit different in that we were looking at what we're actually seeing from impacts right now, which is a lot of the impacts that Jim had talked about earlier um, and trying to address those through our, through our requirements. So ours are a little bit different in, in our water quality and circular requirements. I, I didn't line them up and look at them side by side, um, but there's a good chance they're stricter based on uh, what I think we had a different problem walking into the legalization of what was occurring in Oregon and Washington because of the, of the gray market that was associated with the expansive growth of medical and regulated um, industry before we came across this. Can I ask a quick question on that? Do you think it's also related to climate? I mean, Oregon and Washington are so much wetter in the summer. Is there less of an impact on diversion? Or do they have the same diversion impact that we do here? You know what I mean by having with our drought summer? It's, it's a much bigger deal to have very pretty Yeah, it, it's, it's going to have some impact on the Mediterranean. But we are dry yeah. in a lot of our areas. We see dry summer floods. Um, I think that's fair to say. Um, there, they have a different water rights system kind of set up as well, where um, you know, they, they don't have a public trust authority for Oregon and Washington. A public trust authority is what allows us to take water back from established water rights. So in Oregon and Washington, they have to basically purchase water or people have to dedicate water to water back in the street. Um, and they have had programs set up to do that. They're way ahead of us on establishing industry flows and so I think they're, we're in a better starting space. Um, and we're probably seeing less of a general impact uh, because of the water use and the timing. So. so you guys have a lot of different conversations. Have you seen any appetite in the market for a voluntary standard, sustainability standard, similar to like a, a timber or fisheries you know, to, as an indicator to consumers? Oh, yeah, there's a, certainly I mean, there's a lot of interest, and there's a lot of you know, on, the, on the North Coast in particular, you know, Humboldt, Mendocino you know, County, there are growers who smoke that are interested in stepping forward and you know, best practices and doing the right thing. Um, you know, California growers have done that for a long time. But yeah, no, there's, there's a lot of interest. And I, I think it gets back to, you know, I won't predict the future. I get out of that one. But I think the one thing that it might look like is, I, and I said this earlier, and I think to the extent, you know, if we're successful in the permitting scheme, and enforcement, 
you know, I'm cracking down a lot of these illegal operations. I think the and I think of the extent you've got um, growing remaining up in those counties, it's really going to depend on things like that. You know, the sell this as like we're the progressive, you know, the, the you know, source you of need from the most progressive environment a sustainable source. I think there's a lot of that going on already. I think it'll be there's one certification that I know about so far that we've been um, but then I just read in the press Democrat two days ago that um, there are folks um, who are uh, in, the, in, the, in the Strauss dairy family. They, they're huge organic dairy in Marin County, Marin County, Sonoma County. One of the brothers who's a founder of the Strauss Dairies is very interested in the cannabis space. And so he's mm -hmm. starting. They, it obviously can't be USDA certified organic, but there is a significant interest in sustainable and organic um, and there are a number of key stars in that organic cannabis brand that's not going to be USDA organic, but it's going to be biodynamic. I think it's what he's actually going to be able to get away with certifying it as. <laughs> um, so there's definitely interest. So, um, I mean, a lot of this conversation is for Horizon Marijuana and, and the government coming in in two kind of ways. So, one on the resources side, I'm trying to see how to regulate. Some of the resources that marijuana growers use to grow marijuana. One of those is water. Um, the other one, I think, is, is uh, pesticides. And, 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 and I think there is a big loop of pesticides for pesticides control applicators and advisors, but they cannot put the, their signature because there is no, there are no studies for, for testing how much pesticide residue can be left in the marijuana sweet safe for smoking, the gummies, and all the rest of the products. Um, so that's one. And then the other one on the, so, so in that side, besides the, the loop on the pesticide, is there any other loop on the resources, fertilizer? Or is there any other loop in there? And on the other side, which is on the, on selling the product, um, is there any, any other way that the authorities, uh, California Department of Food and Ag, or, or any other one that are trying to also control marijuana growers? Kind of the parts one on the resource. Are we, is there any loops on, on, on the, on the uh, product side? What, what are the regulations? How, how a marijuana grower, I, I want to know how they actually get it, got it, Pack it and sell it. But what are the regulations in there for actually a marijuana grower selling you a gummy of marijuana? Do you know? Very expensive. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so I don't have those. Ones. But um, to start with the first one uh, for the pesticide regulations, the regulation um, that comes through the Department of Pesticide Regulation. And um, currently, the only thing, basically, cannabis cultivation is being treated uh, is for pesticide application safety. So mm -hmm. that has to be consumed. Um, so it's, it's a very high level, and that's because there is no information about how it moves through the processing and the population or um, So they, they oversee, their regulation oversees all of that component. Um, and then just kind of tied in with that, the Lynchin Center, the Department of Pesticide Regulation in Colorado. And, Washington, mm -hmm. Oregon, are all trying to work on the same organic farming component um, that she had mentioned, and not something other than the, the standard that we could use locally. Um, for the um, for the other piece, for the fertilizers, um, we have some general requirements that address fertilizers. Uh, right now, the thought was that nitrogen was usually the largest issue. So for growth sites over an acre, uh, they do have to develop nitrogen management. And it's going to be similar to the larger ag industry. Um, but we're still trying to figure some of that out, how, how, how much they're using, how much they're using, as well. Um, so we're kind of, we, we look a lot of our requirements and the, the policy of more storage um, and you know, what they can use and stuff that's actually more regulated by other entities. For the, for the kind of process, so the cannabis cultivator. And there's a number of different paths through this, but in general, the cannabis cultivator gets a license from Cal Cannabis, cultivate probably much on their property through whatever tech facility they're cultivating on. Um, that cultivator needs to get a number of permit approvals, local permit approvals, uh, and then after like 
consumer alteration agreement, the uh, general order, enrollment under the general order, or waiver of the um, general order, and a water right if they have a water right. So all of those components. And then that cultivator cultivates their crop, and then you have your basically your, uh, I would say it's the, the dispensary. Distributor, thank you. Wrong <laughs> industry. Uh, the distributor, um, then if, if there's unique licenses, you can get them. standard is distributor would come to the campus location, say pick up that product and bring it in either to manufacturing and it's going to be processed in or, uh, or, uh, or oil or wax or something of that nature, or it's going to be brought in it's, if it's we sold as flour, it'll be brought to the actual uh, it's selling it. Um, Part of that gets, gets shipped off over to it's part of public health that then looks at um, those random tests on the on the different samples to make sure that there's not any COVID and there's any other bad things on it and if there is and burn the whole batch. Um, so that's kind of getting it to there. Um, same thing, manufacturer has the the, um, the distributor bringing it to the um, to the the endpoint. Um, everything has to be bag a certain way of the, of the different plants as it's processed. So there's kind of a processing part of there as well. And, and that's why I'm not sure of the exact steps. Um, but basically then when it gets to the store, they have to recall the product and basically become the person that purchased the product. Um, the concept is once the track and trace program is up and running, that you will know what farm that group uh, is growing at, what plant from the back that came from. So it's supposed to be tracked all the way back from seedling to consider yeah. a QR code or like an RFID strip or something? Yeah, they get that. So I'm not up to speed on the exact technology, but basically they get a bunch of uh, tags. And, you know, start your corporation, have a bunch of seedlings, you get a certain number of tags, and assume a certain number of those seedlings to survive and move to the next stage, the next stage, the next stage. And as they go through the stage, it's supposed to be, and what I last heard, it's, it's going to be some more sophisticated kind of fish tagging. Where it just goes through and it's got a code number, so you scan it and it's going to move it through that next stage where it's going to pick up that code and travels with it. It gets scanned and pick up, scanned and drop off, and it gets uh, an understanding of the highway uh, controls must be able to check it as well. So it should, it's supposed to move all the way through. I don't know where they are, and then I just get up here. So it's on a normal basis. Hey, any last burning question? It says apparently too many about. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, then let's um, thank our speakers.